Hi. So I often get asked to create a course or even sometimes a video on multi-threading in Python. So creating a video I don't quite get because threading is a complex topic and a single video isn't going to do it justice. There's a lot going on with threading, even though, you know, kind of the basic concepts of threading are simple, doing it right is really hard. And this is in part what I'm going to show you in this video. But I also wonder why do I get so many requests to cover multi-threading? And I think, and maybe I'm wrong, so you know, if, if, I'm, if I'm wrong, correct me in the comments, but I think many people ask for multi-threading because they think that multi-threading is what they need to use to speed up their application. And the short answer is that eh, probably not. You know, the, the long answer is, you know, will multi-threading improve the performance of your application depends very much on the kind of workload that you, your app is doing. So if your application workload is mainly CPU related, in other words, think of it this way, if you were to put a faster CPU in your computer, would your program run necessarily much faster as well? And if the answer to that is yes, then most likely your application is being essentially bottlenecked by the CPU. And in that case, this kind of workload is called CPU bound. And in that case, multi-threading is not going to help. You have to understand that in Python, you can create as many threads as you want, but Python itself only allows a single thread to run at a time. So even though you can write concurrent code, so many threads can be created and executed concurrently, we don't have parallelism. The threads are not going to run at the same time. And the Python process is then limited, therefore, to a single core, essentially. You are not able to spread your load across multiple cores or multiple CPUs. So Python enforces this using something called the global interpreter lock, the GIL. And imposing such a global interpreter lock provides a number of distinct advantages. And I'm not going to get into those. They get quite complicated, but I do have a link that I have in the GitHub repo in the readme, which you'll find here. And you can read out, you know, you can read and find out more about what this GIL is. But essentially, that's what makes any Python app limited to a single core, no matter how many threads you create. And no two threads can execute in parallel. There have been attempts to remove the GIL, uh, something called the GILectomy, um, but they haven't really been very conclusive. It's actually slowed Python down quite a bit because of all the extra locks and things like that that now need to happen in order to support this kind of multi-threading without the GIL. I know that there's a, there's a proposition, there's a PEP that came out, somebody pointed that out recently that's trying to do that for the next version of Python. It hasn't been approved yet, we'll see if it does. I think that if it's going to slow Python down, your kind of regular Python apps, your single threaded Python apps, async, single threaded and so on, then I don't think it's going to make it um, into the language. But we'll see that that's still to be determined. So how do you get around this problem, right? Now, if you've got a CPU bound workload and multi-threading isn't going to help, well, you could resort to multi-processing. And again, people have asked me a lot about multiprocessing, but I have a video also in this channel that I did on distributed computing. And what I argued in there is that if you need to start scaling your computations beyond one core, then you may as well bite the bullet and create a truly distributed and scalable computation engine. In that video, I describe a very simple queue worker approach, but there are many other more sophisticated ways of doing this as well. You have platforms that allow you to do that, Spark, Hadoop, even things like Airflow for, you know, work kind of workflows and scaling your workflows. So I don't, I think multiprocessing works, certainly it can spread your load ac across, you know, multiple cores, but now it's limited. It's going to be limited to the number of cores or CPUs that you have on your machine. And if you need to grow beyond that, well, now you have to rewrite your code. So that's why my approach is I do not do multiprocessing. If I know that I'm going to need to be able to scale, then I'm going to write it so I can actually scale out, kind of, you know, infinitely scale out. Now, on the other hand, if your app spends a large portion of its time waiting on many I.O. operations to complete, 
This kind of workload is referred to as IO bound. So maybe your app is doing a lot of things like calling APIs, querying databases, reading and writing files, what have you. It's not spending time doing calculations all the time. That's not the primary workload. Then properly implemented threading may very well speed up your application. But if you're dealing with an IO bound workload, then you might as well use Python's async IO. It will provide the same performance benefits as threading would, but it's simpler to write, it's simpler to read, and it's frankly less error prone than actually threading. Now creating threads in Python is easy. In fact, I think it's way too easy. And the problem is not creating multi-threaded code. That's, that's the simple part. The hard part is writing the problem such that it's logically correct using multi-threaded code. And that's very difficult. It's very difficult to debug. It's very difficult to assert that your code is actually correct, logically correct. And that's in part because the bugs don't show up all the time. They may just show up once in a while and you're kind of scratching your head thinking, well, what went wrong? I'm not sure. I can't reproduce this problem. And therefore it's very difficult to debug. So in this video, we're going to do two problems. The first one is kind of contrived. This problem number one, but it's going to show you some of the techniques with locking and, you know, starting threads and joining threads and things like that. And I just want to show you how difficult things can become. And so that's why I chose this particular problem because that one is really not something I would do with multi-threading or not something that, you know, you should probably attempt with multi-threading, but it's going to show you kind of the caveats and the issues around it. Problem number two is going to be, uh, you know, more realistic. It's going to be a CPU bound workload and we're going to do it naturally first. We're going to basically do an integral, right? We're going to calculate a Riemann sum. And I'll, I've got links to it down in the later in this readme if you don't know what those are, but we'll take a look at Riemann sums and then we'll distribute the workload essentially using threads. And then we're going to look at the timing at the performance of, you know, single threaded versus multi-threaded. All right, so let's dig in. So problem number one, we want to calculate this sequence, one plus two plus three plus up to some number N. And we'll want to print the intermediate results as well. So this is kind of the output that I want my program to achieve. One plus zero equals one, one plus one equals two, then two plus two equals four, etc. So the key here is I'm gonna show you how shared global state in threading very quickly leads to issues. So I'm gonna use global variables for the counter, this zero, one, two, three, four, to keep track of that. And then the cumulative sum, as we're adding, you know, one, two, three, four to the sum, we're gonna keep track of this cumulative sum so that we arrive at a final answer. But here the key is, I don't want just the final answer, I also want this output in the sequence. And that's really important because that's what makes the problem so much harder. So in solution number one, we're going to basically use a standard non-threaded app. That's very easy to do. And it also shows what we want our output to look like. So let's go ahead and write that. So I'm going to create a new Python file. I'm gonna call it p1 solution 01. And that's how I have it numbered in the GitHub repo as well. So for that, we're going to, first of all, I'm going to say the number of iterations that I want. So I'm gonna do a hundred iterations. And then we're going to create our counter variable, which is gonna be global and our cumulative sum, which I'm gonna call sum underscore, of course, the underscore because sum is a built-in function. I don't want to override it. And then we're going to do our work. So let's go ahead, create this function called do work. And I'm going to make a global reference to counter and a global reference to sum, right? Then we're going to say counter equals counter plus one, or you could just say plus equals one. Then next sum is equal to the sum plus the counter, right? That's what the next sum is. So we start the counter at zero, then we're gonna add zero to it. Well, one, because first time we're gonna increment counter to one. So we'll add one, then the next time around, we're gonna add two and so on. So we'll do the loop outside. This is just a single iteration of that loop. So we calculate our next sum, and then we're going to do some print statement. So here I'm gonna say sum underscore plus counter, and that's equal to next sum, 
like so. And then we're going to print some lines out just to separate basically those things as we iterate, as we do the iteration. So we'll do 20 characters like so. And then of course we update now our next, our sum to be the next sum, right? And then in our main application, so I'm just gonna do it this way, equals um, done domain. So if we're running this as an application, this Python file, then we're going to say for i in range, and we're going to basically iterate this many times, and we're going to do the work. So that's why I was saying that this is actually kind of the work that's happening inside the loop, right? And then once we're done, when, you know, once the loop is finished, we're done, we're going to print f, and then we'll say done, and then solution equals, well, whatever the current sum is, like so. Okay, so that's our first program. Let's go ahead and execute it. And I have a typo here, should be some underscore. Let's run it. Okay, so you can see that it, it ran, right? Let's go back to the beginning, zero plus one, one plus two, three plus three, six plus four, 10 plus five, 15 plus six, and so on. And then our final result is 5,050. So now in solution two, we're going to create a thread for each computation. So that do work, we're going to essentially thread that off. We're gonna kick off all those threads and we're gonna wait for the threads to complete. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'm going to create another file. Let's call it p1 solution 02.py. And now let's go ahead and do the threading. So we're gonna need the threading library. So we'll import threading. Then we need, again, the same thing as before, num iter equals 100, our counter equals zero, our sum equals zero. These are all global variables. We're going to define our do work function again. Now, we're just gonna keep it the same as what we had before, right? I'm just going to take this as is and basically replace it here. And let's put in some spacing. And then if name equals main. And now what we're going to do is I'm going to create the threads. Now I wanna keep track of the threads that I create. You'll see why in a second. So the first thing is we're gonna create the threads. So for i in range num iter, we're going to say threads dot append. So I'm, now this, this threads here has nothing to do with the threading library. This is just my list over here, right? So I've got this threads list. So I'm gonna say threads dot append. And now this is where I create the thread. So I say threading dot thread. And then my target is the function do work. Do not call the function. This is incorrect. We're referencing the function, right? We're passing a reference to the do work function to this target argument here. That's it, our threads have been created. Now we need to start the threads. So for thread in threads, we'll say thread.start. And what I need to do now, I, I wanna print done, right? I wanna print f, I wanna do an f string. So we'll say done, actually, let me just copy it from here. We basically wanna take this string over here and print this. The problem, of course, is that once all my threads have started, this could print before the threads have all finished running. And that's not what I want. So I need to wait until all the threads have finished their work, right? Where I'm gonna spawn essentially 100 threads. I need to wait for all of them to finish. And to do that, I need to join each thread. So we're going to say for thread in threads, and then we'll say thread.join. And this is why I needed a reference to the threads because I need to be able to start them and I want to join as well. Now, what this means is that this application at this point is going to block until all the threads have completed. And then, and then once that's done, then it's gonna go ahead and run this final you know, print statement. Okay, so that's the code. That's the threading, and you can see it's very simple to start a thread. 
Now let's go ahead and run this. And you'll see that we have problems, right? So we get 0 plus 1 equals 1, that's great. 0 plus 2 equals, I'm assuming that's a 2, then 0 plus 3 equals 3, 0 plus 4 equals 4, 1 plus 5 equals 6, 3 plus 6 equals 9, and then 3 plus 7 equals 10. So you can see we've got problems going on all over the place, right? These things aren't printing in the correct order. We are, it's not even incrementing things you know, correctly. We basically have lots of different problems, right? Like 301 plus 33, 301 plus 34. So that, that sum wasn't picked up correctly. Now, the interesting thing is that at the very end, our solution also is incorrect. It picked up this 3,214. One of the first things that we'll look at is the fact that that line doesn't always show up in the right spot. And this is because print is not thread safe. What happens is that, first of all, what is print printing out to? It's printing out to our console, to our standard out. That's a shared resource, right? All the threads are printing to the same console and print actually buffers its output, right? And so this output is shared by all the threads. Print itself is buffering, you know, its output. And so what can happen is that before a thread finishes printing something out to the console, another thread comes in, interrupts that, because we have no control when threads get interrupted, at least not at this point. So another thread comes in and it starts printing its stuff out before the other one's finished. And this is why we're seeing this kind of problem. There's a competition for a shared resource by different threads, and that's called a race condition. We're going to see how we to try and fix the problem of the computations. Let's first try and solve the problem of the printing that it's not thread safe. So let's switch back to code and let's do another file. So this one will be p1 solution03.py. So I'm going to take the code from 2 and we're going to fix a few things. So what the idea behind trying to make something thread safe, basically, once a thread is running a piece of code, you essentially want to stop any other thread from being able to run that same piece of code until you say it's okay to run it. So for that, we use something called a lock and we need to acquire locks and release locks. So to protect essentially a piece of code, we're going to acquire a lock around these print statements. That way, no other thread can interrupt that particular piece of code on lines 16 and 17. So for that, we're going to create a print lock. You can call it whatever you want. I just call it plock for print lock. And again, we're going to use the threading library and we're going to create a lock instance, an instance of the lock class. And then all we need to do here is say plock.acquire. Now note, I do not need to say global plock because I'm not modifying plock. I'm just using its functions, its methods. And then here we'll say plock underscore release, like so. And, oh, that's dot release, okay? And that's all we need to do. That, that's it. That's our solution to fixing the problem around the print. We need to put in this lock. So now let's run this code again. Let's see what we get. Well, that looks much better, right? We, we get the things at least are printing in the proper order. Now, it could be that everything ran fine, right? It looks like it's running fine. I don't have time to kind of check every single one, but you can see our solution is wrong anyways. So something is still going on with the actual computation code. Now, before I move on to solving that problem, Lock objects, the lock that we saw that we use to do the acquire and release, also actually implement a context manager. So instead of writing acquire and release ourselves, we can simply use a context manager, which is much simpler and saves us having to potentially handle exceptions that could occur between the acquire and release because you need to release your locks. If you do not release a lock, essentially you're going to block that piece of code that, you know, that comes after the acquire forever. No other thread will be able to run that same piece of code and so you're going to have a problem. So you always need to release and just like context managers with files that automatically close the file no matter what 
no matter how you exit the context manager, same thing happens with the lock. So let's do that quickly. We're going to call, I'm just going to copy and paste it. And then we're going to call this solution 3A. So it's the same as 3. The only difference is that I'm not going to do this over here. Instead, I am going to use the actual context manager. So we'll say with P underscore lock. And then under that, we'll put the two print statements like so. All right. So that's all I wanted to show you is that this is probably a better way of, of doing your locks is using the context manager. Let's go ahead and run it. And again, we can see we have the wrong solution, but at least everything's printing out in the correct order. At least we're getting, you know, that print, that print, followed by another print, then the line, print in the line, print in the line and so on. Okay, so now let's look at the calculations. The calculations are completely off. So why? Well, look at this piece of code that's being executed by each thread. Now you have to remember threads can be interrupted at any time. And that's mostly outside of our control. It's this so-called preemptive multitasking. It's not cooperative, right? Lux is where you start getting into more cooperative multitasking and you have to implement Lux yourself to fix this problem of race conditions. So here's what could happen. One thread could be executing line four. So it's read the current value of sum and counter and it's calculated next. But before it can execute lines eight and nine, which is sum next counter and counter plus one, it gets interrupted and another thread comes in and it picks up sum underscore and counter. And so now you've got two threads that have, you know, that are basically reading the same value. So again, we have a wrong, you know, we have a race condition and that's, that's our problem. So we need to use locks for our global state variables as well. So let's go ahead and put those locks in. So let's create a file P1 solution underscore zero four. And so we're going to take three a, we'll take that solution, paste it here. And now I need another lock. So I'm going to create another lock. This one I'm going to call the compute lock where you can call it whatever you want. And again, it's just another lock object that we're going to use. And what am I going to lock? Well, I need to change how this whole computation thing is going on because I need to make it thread safe, right? So I'm going to write it this way. I'm going to use the context manager with C lock. Then I'm going to read the previous sum into, I'm going to, sorry, read the current sum into a variable called previous sum. I'm going to increment the counter right away. Then I'm going to calculate next sum equals sum underscore plus counter. And then our sum, of course, our new sum is now the next sum. And the reason why I've broken it out this way is I want to lock the computation side, right? So I don't want to do it this way. I want to take that all that out, but I also want to be able to print out this, you know, what the sum was, what the previous sum was, plus the new counter and the next values. That's why I've kind of broken up, broken the, the computations out this way. In part, it's because I need them to do the printing. So here, this is actually previous sum plus counter equals next sum and that, okay. So we've put now a lock around this. We had to put a lock around this. So basically we're kind of locking the entire thing. So at this point, you know, we may very well say, well, we just need a single lock and we'll just lock everything in this function. But let's go ahead and try it. And let's run this. And you see that we get the correct solution down here, but there's odd things going on. Look at this counter over here. It's staying the same, right? And and yet like 4656 plus 100 is not 4753. So we still have issues. And if you were to run this multiple times, you would probably get also, you know, every time you'd see that you have issues. Now, sometimes it will it might work correctly and sometimes it might not. So although we eliminated the race condition, we still have a problem where the threads are not executing the calculations in the correct 
order, since we really have no control on when threads run and get interrupted. But at least we're getting the correct final result. And usually, when we're doing computations in multi-threading, we're only interested in that final result. And I should say in general of concurrent programming. When you're doing, when you're trying to write a concurrent program, one of the key you know, designs that you need to do with your program is that it should not be dependent on the order of execution of the concurrent pieces of code. Whether they execute in parallel or not is immaterial. Concurrency and, you know, parallelism, parallelism is, is a way of executing concurrent code, but concurrency is about how you design your code to run concurrently. So this is the problem, right? That's why I was saying initially that this really isn't a good problem for threading because it's very difficult to write this in a concurrent way. So the intermediate calculation display is off. It looks like we're getting a correct final result. And I want to show you another technique that can help, you know, kind of bring out problems in your multi-threaded code. And that's a technique called fuzzing. And basically what fuzzing is in this context is adding random periods of time for the computations, for the, you know, for our code that's running multi-threaded. And the reason you do that is because in reality, you know, when you push a program out, when it's running in production, you're not guaranteed that everything's always going to run, you know, at the same speed, right? All the time. So here we may be seeing that where we're getting correct results because everything is kind of running, you know, at the same speed. So things are still happening in a certain sequence and so on. And fuzzing allows you to force that issue and bring that to the front. So it's a very simple concept. Let's go ahead and do that. So we're going to say solution 05. So P1, solution 05. And basically I'm going to take solution four again and just copy paste that. So this is our code from solution four. But now I'm going to introduce a function called fuzz and I'm going to need a couple more libraries. So let's go ahead and import them. I need random and then I also need from time import sleep. Okay, so let's go ahead and do this def fuzz function and it's just going to basically sleep for a random period of time. So we'll say sleep random random. So that is going to be a number between zero and one. I don't want to pause up to one second. So I want to do kind of a max of 0.1 seconds. You don't need to fuzz a lot, right? Just a little bit here and there. And what do you do with this function? Well, you kind of sprinkle it around essentially in your code. Just go, you know, go for it. Just put it wherever you want. So let me copy that. Let's put a fuzz here. Now there's a lock here. So fuzzing is probably not going to do anything. You could, if you wanted to put a fuzz in here as well, that's fine. Then maybe uh, I'll fuzz after the print here as well. Maybe you could even want to fuzz here, right? And just want to see that the two, the prints are still working correctly when you basically allow something out, allow a thread, give enough time for another thread to interrupt. But since we have a lock, the other thread shouldn't be able to run this part of the code when it's running because it's locked, right? And we haven't released it yet. So that's good enough and that's fuzzing. So let's go ahead and run this and see what we get. So it's a little slower, obviously, because we're slowing down the calculations. So you can see we still get the correct result, right? And zero plus two is one. Well, that's kind of weird, right? One plus three is three, three plus four is six. So you can see that fuzzing kind of exacerbated the problem that we were seeing, that things just don't look right, even though the final result is correct. And so this is not something we can solve with locks. We, we need to ensure that the work being done is performed in a sequential manner somehow. And this is typically, as I mentioned just now, not how concurrent programming works. One key principle is that the order of execution should not matter. And hence why I said right in the beginning, this isn't a good example of something you would want to throw, you know, multi-threading at. 
So for obtaining the final result, our algorithm seems to work fine, but the intermediate calculations is totally off. So since it looks like our calculation is actually correct, the final calculation, maybe there's something wrong related to the printing. I think that what's happening is that things are not printing in the correct order. So to solve this problem, we're going to use a queue. Instead of the thread printing directly, we're going to send the print output to a queue and then we'll have a single thread watching that queue and printing out those lines one by one in a first in first out manner. Now Python provides us thread safe queues in the queue module because you have to be careful when you're using threads, when you're doing things inside a function that's going to be called in, you know, in a thread, you need to make sure that everything is thread safe, which could mean using thread safe objects, using locks, and there's other things as well that I won't get into. And then of course, I'm also going to add some variability to starting the threads because I'm starting the threads kind of one right after the other, right? I'm not giving them time to run before I start the next thread. So I'm gonna fuzz that as well to see if it makes a difference. So let's go ahead and do that. So this is gonna be solution six. And Python file, problem one, solution zero six. Let's go ahead and just copy the code from five. But we're gonna to have to make some pretty substantial changes here. So we've got this computation lock. I'm gonna keep that, but I'm gonna take away this print lock. We don't need that. Instead, I'm going to print another, I'm gonna print, I'm gonna create another object that I'll call my print queue, which is gonna come from the queue module. So we need to go ahead and import it. So we'll import Q. And that's going to be our print Q. We need to make an instance of that. We'll keep the fuzz. And then let's go ahead and define a function that's going to essentially take items from the queue and print them out to the console. So let's call it the print Q watcher. And all that is going to do, it's going to be an infinite loop. Basically, this is something that I'm going to run on a thread and it's going to run forever. And it's going to look for an item from the queue, from the print queue. So we're going to say print queue dot get. Then we're going to fuzz and this will block. The get will block until an item comes in. Then once it comes in, it will get put into this variable here, then we're going to print the item. So it's gonna be a string, right? We're just gonna print that string, whatever it is. Let's fuzz again. And then we're going to now tell the queue that, hey, we're done with that particular uh, you know, element that we popped off the queue. So that's our queue watcher. We'll have to use threads to start it. And then for the do work, we're going to change things a little bit. What I'm going to do is now we can simplify this whole thing here a little bit. First of all, we're going to get rid of the lock and the print over here. We don't need those anymore. And let me leave that code in as I'm rewriting it. So the first thing we're going to do is increment by one. Then we're going to say next sum is equal to sum underscore plus counter. And then we're going to print, but now we're not going to actually print we're going to send something to the print queue. So we'll put our string that we want to print inside the print queue. Now let's go ahead and write that. That's going to be sum underscore plus counter equals next sum. And then we'll do print queue dot put like so, so we have our line and then we can say sum underscore equals next sum, something like that. So yes, I could have put a lock around the whole print statements and everything, but I wanna show you how you can use a queue also to solve certain problems. And then we're gonna fuzz, okay. So that's our do work. We're not actually printing anymore, we're sending it to a queue. And this is very common, by the way, this is a very common way of doing things when you're multi-threading and you, you want to be able to avoid certain race conditions.
So we're going to do the same thing. We're going to start our threads, but now we also need to start the thread that's for the print queue watcher. So we're going to say threading dot thread, and we're going to specify our target, which is the print queue watcher. This one again, we're not calling the function, so remove the parentheses. And the other thing that we're going to specify here is that it should be a daemon thread or daemon thread. I'm not sure how that's pronounced. I'll, I pronounce it daemon. What is that? Well, what happens is that when your program terminates, right? Let's say that I don't join this thread because that's never going to finish, right? If I join the print queue watcher thread or that thread that's running that function, well, this is an infinite loop. This particular thread, if I join it at this point over here, let's say, the program is never going to terminate because nothing is stopping that thread. So instead, we use a daemon thread. And the way that the daemon threads work is that once I do, you don't join daemon threads, and once your program exits, then this thread will be killed automatically by Python. If you don't do that, your program will just basically hang there because you've got some thread that's still running, right? Even if you don't join, it's so that's the other thing, right? If you don't join that thread and it's not a daemon thread, your program still ends technically, right? This thing is going to finish, it's going to exit, but you still have a thread running. And so your Python application as a whole is still running. So you need to kill that thread. So instead of, you know, manually killing it, well, all I'm going to do basically is say, hey, you know, just make it a daemon thread. Now we'll have to be a little bit careful because we have a daemon thread, but we don't want to exit before the, before the queue is empty. So we'll have to put a catch for that. So we've got this daemon thread. We start our threads just like before. Nothing changes. We start. And here's where I said I was going to add a fuzz in there. Then we're going to join the threads. But is our program done? No. The program is done when, once the queue is empty. So I need to somehow say that I want to wait until the queue is empty because if all the threads are done with their calculations and the queue is empty, then I'm really done, right? Because I've done all the calculations and I've printed everything to the screen, to the console. So for this, we're going to use the join method of the print queue. It has a method called join and essentially it does exactly what you think because if you think of what it does with threads, it waits until it's finished. Here, what the join means is wait until the queue is empty. And then we're done with our solution. So let's go ahead and run that. Let's see what we get. And we get nothing happening. What's going on? Well, <laughs> let me stop it. One thing I forgot to do, I created this thread. I didn't start it. Right? So basically, these things are all done. They've pushed their, their values to the print queue, but this thread is not running, so nothing's actually emptying the queue. And so the print queue join is just waiting. It's waiting for that queue to empty, and nothing's going to empty it because this thread isn't running. So we need to say start. Okay? All right. Now let's try again. All right. So we're done. And you can see now that it looks like everything's kind of working correctly, right? 4186, 4186, 4278, 4278. We're seeing the counter incrementing correctly and so on. So the solution seems to work, but I'm still not convinced this is logically correct. I may be missing something that I failed to see and which will come back and bite me at some later point. And if you spot something that I missed, feel free to point it out, you know, in the comments. Personally, I believe that the reason this is working is that we have essentially put a lock around the entire set of calculations and the prints, which basically blocks any other thread from interrupting the computation. And essentially, this is rendering our calculation flow linear instead of truly concurrent. And I think that's why it's working in this particular case. And as I said, this is not a good example of where you would use multi-threading. But hopefully what I've convinced you of is that multi-threading is hard. It's way too easy to make mistakes. And this is one of the reasons why I hardly ever use multi-threading. Okay, so for solution number seven, we're gonna take a look at timings. 
So our multi-threading right, application was hard. And I'm not even sure it's actually fully correct, but what about timings? Well, let's time our initial single-threaded approach first. So let's go ahead, let's go back to the code. And I'm just going to copy paste that from the repo. There's no need for me to retype that. And basically this is the same code that we had in solution one. No different, except that we've got the perf counter and I'm also making now the number of iterations 100,000. So we're gonna run it a little bit more and then we're just going to time. We're going to start the perf counter, we're gonna do the work and then we're gonna end. And let's see what we get. So let's run that. And so we get 0 0.26 seconds. So write that down somewhere, I'm going to. And now let's go ahead and do the same thing, but timing our multi-threaded code. So again, I'm just gonna copy that from the repo. So we'll paste that in here. That will be solution number eight or zero eight. And it's the same code as before that we had in solution six. So it's the exact same code except that I took out all the fuzzing, right? We don't need the fuzzing because that's obviously gonna slow things down. So we need to take all the fuzzing out and then we also need to time things. So that's essentially what I've done here. I've taken the fuzzing out and then I just, you know, start my performance counter here, uh, or at least I probe the performance counter. I probe it again over here and then I'll know what my elapsed time is. So let's go ahead and run this one. So let's run eight. And that took 4.12 seconds. Remember what we had before? We had 0 0.26 seconds. Now we have four seconds. So this was a substantial increase in time, right? We actually slowed things dramatically down by going multi-threaded. Okay, so the, that problem we just looked at was a little bit contrived. It wasn't just to make things simple to explain some of the basics of multi-threading, but also to highlight some of the concurrency issues we often face. So for this example, we're gonna do something a little bit more practical. We're gonna calculate a definite integral of some function using simple Riemann sums. And I give you a link over here if you wanna go see it to see what a Riemann sum is. Basically, we're gonna calculate the area under a curve and you do it by taking these rectangles and just calculating the height of the rectangles based on the function and then summing up the areas. And as you do more and more of them, you get closer and closer to the definite integral. So if you don't understand that, that's not a big deal because really it's all about the computations. For solution number one, it's just gonna be a single threaded approach and there are ways to simplify the code but that's not what I'm aiming for. I really wanna have clarity in the code here, not necessarily the most efficient way of doing things. But as long as we use the same technique for both the single-threaded and the multi-threaded solutions, we'll have some, you know, two solutions that we can compare at least. Okay, so let's go ahead and write that. So now I'm gonna create P2, solution zero one, and I'm just gonna copy paste the code from the notebook, or from the, from the Git repo, I should say. Let's go through it though. So the first thing is, this is the number of intervals. This is the number of rectangles that I wanna use essentially to calculate my Riemann sum. And we're gonna use right Riemann sums. So we're gonna have a function, and this function is going to be the square root of one minus x squared. So essentially, this is a semicircle that's centered at zero. So think of a semicircle centered at zero, it's gonna go from negative one to one on the x-axis, right? And so what should the area of this semicircle be? Well, the area of a full circle would be pi r squared. So this is a circle of radius one, so the full circle would be pi, so the semicircle should have an area of pi over two. And so this is how we're gonna do our Riemann sum. We're gonna have the delta is the width of the interval, we're going to have a, which is our lower bound, which is gonna be negative one. So we're gonna integrate from negative one to one. We can therefore calculate the size of those small intervals in the Riemann sum this way by taking b minus a divided by the number of intervals. Then we're gonna calculate the area by calling the Riemann sum. 
and we're going to give it the function. We're going to tell it what the delta size is. We're going to tell it what A is. We're also going to tell it where to start summing those intervals. And the, way I've, the reason I've done it this way is because when we do the multi-threaded, I'm going to want to create multiple of those Riemann sum functions that is going to start, you know, that's basically going to split the interval up. Let's go back to this thing over here. So when we're doing, make that a little bit bigger. So let's say when we're doing this calculation over here, now ours is going to be a semicircle, but it doesn't matter. I'm going to do a thread, you know, with the threading, I'm going to maybe take the first four intervals and say, hey, thread number one, you do the first four intervals. Thread number two, you do the next four intervals. Thread number three, you do the next four intervals. Do your work. And then at the very end, I'll come back and sum up all the results, all the areas that were calculated by each thread to come to the final total. That's perfect for concurrency. That's a perfect kind of application for concurrency because it makes absolute sense. The order in which we're executing you know, the, the pieces that sum up the areas of those little rectangles doesn't matter. We just care about the actual result and we care about adding them all up at the end of the day, not the order in which it was done. So switching back to the code, that's what we're doing here. Now, I only need to really call this function once here because I'm doing that now in the range, right? My loop for calculating all those rectangles, I can do in one shot. And then we'll do the perf counter as well. So let's go ahead and run that. So you can see that the area it calculated was 1.57 and pi over two, taking pi from the math library is 1.570796. So it's, it's really close, right? With, with uh, 10 million intervals. And it took 0 0.9 seconds. So it took less than a second. Again, you should write that number down because we'll need it for the next comparison. So let's switch now to writing our multi-threaded version of this same thing. So again, I'm just going to copy co paste the code from the repo and let's go through the code. So we still have the same function as before. We have the same number of intervals and I'll come back to this number of threads. We have the same Riemann sum function, right, that we had before. But what we're going to do is we're going to take those intervals that we have and we're going to split those intervals up into chunks, into contiguous chunks of intervals. So let's say the first chunk might be interval 0 to 100, right? Will be those, those first 100 rectangles under the curve. The next chunk is going to be chunk 101 to 200 and then 201 to 300. And then we'll have a thread essentially do the Riemann sum for each one of those. And we're going to actually just append it to a global variable, which is going to be results. So this result is global, but we don't need to protect it with a lock because each thread is just going to append to it. And we don't care about the order in which it's getting appended and nothing is going to try and access the results until we're all done. So no thread is going to be kind of competing with another thread to access the results. They just keep appending to it. So we do not have to put a lock around the results in our Riemann sum function. So this split function basically just splits up, you know, let's say I say, hey, I want 10,000 intervals or 10 million intervals, and I want them split up into n chunks. Right. And the number of chunks that I'm going to want to do is going to be the number of threads. So I'm going to want to create 10,000 threads. So I need to create 10,000 chunks from this 10 million, these 10 million rectangles that we're summing up. So that's all that's doing. It calculates the chunks using number intervals and num threads. Then we do the same thing that we saw before. We create a list for the threads. Then we basically go through each chunk. And the chunk, by the way, returns the start and end indices. So we're going to create those threads. We're going to target the Riemann sum. Now, what's interesting with threads is that you can also pass arguments so that that function, when it gets called, will receive those arguments. What does my function need? Well, it needs func delta a i start and i end. 
So that's exactly the arguments I'm going to pass it. I have func, that's the function over here, this one. I have the delta, which I've defined here. I have a, which is minus one. I have the i stout, which is going to come from the chunks and the i end, that's going to come from the chunk as well. So here I'm just basically preparing my threads, creating the threads, and then I'm going to start and join the threads. So I'm going to do a thread start and then thread join. And let's do them in two separate loops. It, let's keep it the same as what we had before. So we'll start and join the threads. And then once the threads are done, then we know that we have everything we need inside the results list. So we can sum up the elements of the results list to get our final area. And then again, we probe our perf counter, we get the start and end delta, and that will tell us the elapsed time in seconds. And then we can see what the result is. Okay, so that's the multi-threaded approach. It's certainly not as complicated as the one that we had in the first example, but it shows you how to use the threading. And this is a truly, you know, a good example for concurrent processing. Okay, let's run this and let's see the magic of threads. Okay, it took 1.3 seconds. What did our original one take? 0 0.9 seconds. So as you can see, not only the threading make our code more complicated, it's very difficult to make sure we got it right. It didn't speed up anything. In fact, it's slowed it down. And that was the whole point I wanted to make with this video, or at least one of the points, is that threading isn't a magical solution to speeding up your application. Here we worked with a problem that was CPU bound. The time spent was spent doing what? Calculations. And so that's why we did not get an increase in performance by using threading. So in conclusion, I hope I've shown you two things. Multi-threading is hard and CPU bound workloads do not benefit from multi-threading and may in fact result in worse performance. Now there are of course other use cases for threading, even apart from IO workloads. And for IO workloads, as I mentioned, I would use async IO instead, it's much easier. For example, you may have a main application running and at the same time, you need some other thread to perform some unrelated work on a periodic basis that just needs to run concurrently. For example, it could be a heartbeat that you need to emit from your code, but your main code might be blocking, right? Waiting for something to happen. You still want that heartbeat to go out. Well, just use a thread, just do that, right? Because the threads will just interrupt. It's not like async IO, which needs to be cooperative. This is preemptive. So your thread is gonna get essentially halted and your heartbeat thread is gonna run and then so on, right? So I've been writing Python for more than 15 years in a business environment. I don't write libraries, I don't do, you know, that kind of stuff, but I work in a business environment. I've done API work, data pipelines, analysis, DevOps type work and so on. And I've used multi-threading in production a few times only. Now, of course, your mileage may very well vary. Like if you're writing advanced libraries, maybe there's things with, you know, uh, with computational libraries, like with machine learning, where computations are being offloaded to a GPU, then things kind of change there, right? Then, you know, and especially if you're trying to write libraries around that kind of stuff, then yeah, most likely you're gonna need multi-threading. But for everyday use, multi-threading isn't something you just do that much. And personally, and for the majority of the work I do, it's something I'm really, really wary of because it's so easy to make a mistake. All right, that's my take on threading. Thanks for watching.